So our last session is on raw materials. First, we're going to get a policy update on the EU-Canada strategic partnership on raw materials. And this will focus on the integration of EU-Canada raw material value chains, collaboration on science, tech, and innovation, and of course, ESG criteria and standards. And then we will have our industry leaders and exports, uh, experts explore ways to enhance this strategic partnership. They are going to discuss the challenges and opportunities in the field of raw materials and how we can support the transition to a low carbon economy. So I will now invite our moderator and the panelists to come and join us here on the stage and uh, while I introduce the moderator. So. So our moderator for this session is Artem Barsukov, who is a Swedish and Russian-speaking lawyer based in Edmonton, who specializes in global arbitration and construction law. With nearly a decade of experience in international dispute resolution, Artem has successfully represented clients all over the world in complex international and domestic arbitrations worth over $2 billion. Artem has particular expertise in construction disputes and has acted for owners, for contractors, and subcontractors in a wide variety of disputes arising from large-scale international construction projects. So I will now invite Artem to uh, introduce our panelists and, um, and, and, and I believe to introduce um, our first expert who will give us an update on policy. Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the EU Canada Business Day. It's great to have you here. And we'll start off, as Kathy said, by giving you a policy update on the EU Canada Strategic Partnership on Raw Materials. Today with us, we have Alana Schaus, who is a Senior Policy Advisor with Natural Resources Canada. In her position, she is responsible for European bilateral relations for, critical, um, for mining and crucial and critical minerals. She joined Natural Resources Canada in 2019 and has worked for the Government of Canada since 2008. Prior to joining Natural Resources Canada, Alana worked for Employment and Social Development Canada for many years, contributing to the Government of Canada's social policy agenda. She graduated from Trent University with an honours in Business Administration, and she's working out of Ottawa, and is enjoying everything that the national capital has to offer with her family, including all the great cycling and cross-country skiing trails. Next to Alana is Andrea von Walter, who is the head of the Trade and Economic Section of the Europe, of Delegation of the European Union to Canada since September 2022. This section covers all aspects of the EU-Canada economic relations, including trade in goods, services and investment, agriculture, energy, raw materials, environment, competition and research. Prior to joining the EU delegation, Andrea was leading a team of lawyers colleague of mine, uh, working on investment law and dispute settlement in the Directorate General for Trade of the European Commission. He has represented the EU in bilateral negotiations with Singapore, Vietnam, Morocco, Japan, Canada, Mexico, and the United States. He also acted as the EU chief negotiator for several multilateral negotiations within the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, or UNCITRAL, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, or ICSID, as well as the Energy Charter Treaty. Welcome to both of you. So let's start with Andre. Why don't you give us a brief update on the EU policy on raw materials and the latest developments there? this now you cannot hear me I will hold it like this yes okay um, great your excellency um, dear Adrian dear Katy mr. Spitznagel I pronounce this correctly thanks to my German background I assume um, now I would like really uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and I would like to really uh, thank um, you can and also Bennett Jones for, for organizing this panel on this very timely and important topic of uh, raw materials cooperation between the EU and Canada. I have seen that the subtitle of um, today's event is United, Uniting for Economic Security, and this is indeed what our partnership is today with Canada. It's no longer only about increasing our trade and investment flows for having growth on both sides of the Atlantic. It becomes really about, about 
ensuring our joint security in this in a more and more challenging geopolitical context uh, for mastering our green transition, our digital transition, but also um, for ensuring, for example, an, an a future-proof health policy or defense policy, and in all these sectors, uh, critical raw materials are really essential. And it is a well-known fact that um, that the European Union is uh, relying uh, almost exclusively on imports for for raw ma critical raw materials today, often from only one or from only a very small handful of third countries. And uh, it is also known that the EU demand for strategic raw materials is expected to grow considerably. Uh, just to give you a few examples, for wind turbines, for example, we expect to need nearly five times more rare earth metals by 2030 than today. And for electric vehicle batteries, uh, we will need 11 times more lithium in 2030 than today. And I'm only giving the more, as has been said, tangible figures 2030, because if I would say our expectations were 2050, this is really skyrocketing, and so I, I spare you this. Um, so in this context, um, reliable partners like Canada, who share our values, our ESG uh, commitments, aspirations, are uh, more and more crucial. Uh, also because there are more and more countries in the world to adopt more restrictive policies in the areas of raw materials. And so we really need to partner here with countries like Canada who are open also to cooperate with us. So today, what I would like to do is to give a very brief update on the recent develop most recent developments within the EU in our policy on raw materials. And then my colleague, Alana, will uh, go into more more detail also on the Canadian perspective and in our strategic partnership. So, as I said, um, the EU is heavily relying on imports for raw materials and it is clear that we will never be fully self-sufficient, um, maybe by really scaling up massively our recycling capacity one day we will be not too far away from self-sufficiency, but this is really for the long long term. And so against this background, we have started a lot of initiatives. We have started in 2008, the first uh, raw materials initiative. In 2020, the uh, EU, EU action plan for raw materials. And it's on this basis of this action plan that we have then concluded our first strategic partnerships with Canada and then with Ukraine also. And all these initiatives have led um, to very good and results and achievements. And Alana, I count on you to go into more detail on this. But we have recently also realized that um, these initiatives have not been sufficient to fully ensure our security of supply for raw materials. And we have come to realize that we need to do more. We need to increase the production and processing also within the EU. Uh, we need to also further diversify our external suppliers. Uh, we need to coordinate better between the EU and EU member states on strategic, uh, strategic stocks and informations. And we also need to enhance the circularity even more. And it is for all these reasons that the European Commission has very recently proposed a new legislation. It was on 16th of March. That is called the EU Critical Raw Materials Act. And um, you may have heard about it. I will not go into all the details, but I would like to briefly highlight four of the main features of this new piece of, of legislation. So the first part I want to highlight is that we are setting objectives for the EU. Here again with the horizon of 2030, uh, we have set the uh, commitment that the EU's extraction capacity of strategic raw materials should be able to meet at least 10% of our annual consumption. We have set the objective that our processing capacity should be able to meet at least 40% of our annual consumption by 2030. We have set the objective that our recycling capacity should be able to meet 15% of our annual consumption. And when it comes to the external supply and diversification, the regulation foresees that in 2030, the European Union should not import more than 65% of a particular particular raw materials from one third country. There are some, in the explanatory memorandum, there may be some exceptions foreseen for partner countries with whom we have strategic partnerships like Canada or the Ukraine, but these are the objectives for now in terms of diversification. Um, the second main feature of the regulation are new enabling conditions that aim to tackle 
the most commonly reported inhibitors for for projects in the raw material sector, which is the lengthy permitting processes and the difficulties to access finance. So what is foreseen is that EU member states, they must set up so-called one-stop shops, within the, meaning one national authority that is in charge of, of conducting and facilitating the permitting process for these raw material projects. And the regulation also creates a new categ category of so-called strategic projects. Uh, which are projects that are uh, that contribute to the union security of supply that are technically feasible that are sustainable and that must be of benefit for more than one EU member state and if you have a raw materials project like this uh, every promoter can apply to the European Commission to have this project recognized as being a strategic project for the EU and then a number of, of um, benefits will apply. So one benefit, for example, is that for strategic projects, the regulation foresees very ambitious timelines for the permitting processes. It is foreseen that for extraction process, uh, pro projects, the permitting process should not be longer than 24 months and for processing and recycling projects, it's even short it is 12 months a maximum timeline for these uh, for the permitting of these projects um, also it is foreseen that different permitting processes must be bundled for example environmental impact assessments and other permitting projects should be bundled in one procedure this is I think a little bit similar to what Canada has also alluded to in its recent strategy and um, also, the dispute settlement proceedings should also be streamlined. So it is foreseen that member states have to put up so-called um, urgency proceedings that apply for dispute settlement mechanisms when it comes to these permitting projects of what, what has been identified as a strategic project, project for the EU. Um, another um, benefit is, um, um, is access to financing. So what the regulation foresees also is that with regard to these identified strategic projects, the governing body that will be set up with this new legislation, which is the, called the European Critical Raw Materials Board. Uh, this board will meet with EU member states and European financial institutions like the European Investment Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and others to, to really um, explore all possible ways to finance and to improve the financing for these uh, projects. And also the Commission is instructed to set up a, a system to facilitate the conclusion of off-take agreements for these strategic projects. What I would like to stress here is that these strategic projects, they do not need to be located uh, on EU territory. So it could very well be that a project, a Canadian project, because of its strategic importance for the EU security of supply, can apply and obtain the status of strategic project and then has also all these um, these benefits, for example, in terms of financing, access to finance. Of course, we cannot regulate on the length of the Canadian permitting process, so this will not apply, but for the financing, uh, the benefits will be there, of course. Um, the third feature I would like to briefly highlight is um, our new steps to monitor and mitigate the supply risk. So we will have an increased exchange of information between the EU and its member states on the stocks of critical raw materials. Uh, the European Commission will set, a, set up a monitoring dashboard, run stress tests for, for each of these raw materials and publish the, the results thereof. And another measure foresees for large companies, which are defined as having over 500 employees and having an annual turnover of over 100 million euros. So these large uh, companies that are manufacturing some strategic products that are listed in the regulation, batteries, robotics, uh, satellites, etc. Um, they will be required also to make regular audits of their raw material supply chain. So this, uh, there's a requirement to really order, audit here the security of the supply for the future. And finally, and I will um, try, try to be short on this, uh, the regulation also foresees uh, to, to really um, speed up the circularity and recycling of raw materials. So member states are instructed to set up incentives for recycling of raw materials to also revisit, for example, closed mines and closed mining facilities uh, and check the potential there. And for example, for um, permanent magnets, there will be new labeling requirements um, that um, require um, 
operators who place a product on the, your market to clearly indicate where the magnets are, what the magnets are, what the composition is, so that it just makes it more easier actually for the recycling process to access these materials in the future. So this is in a in a nutshell, the main features of this new uh, proposal that we have tabled just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we believe it's a quite ambitious and, and comprehensive proposal that should address, um, we hope, most of the inhibitors and shortcomings of the current uh, market dynamics. But I would very much be interested in actually hearing the, the views of, of experts in the room, of industry on this and in also in the next panel, um, because of course this regulation is now going into a legislative process with discussions among your member states in the Council, discussions in the European Parliament, and so there's still room for manoeuvre to change it and adapt it if, if you believe that we got it wrong or there's something that can be improved in here. So um, I'm looking very much forward to this, but before I think we take the questions, I return um, to my seat and hand the desk to, to um, Alana, right? Thank you, Andre. <laughs> Just a quick housekeeping matter. Could we please uh, have the slides for Alana on the screen and uh, get a clicker? And Alana, I'd like to invite you to share uh, an update on the Canada's critical mineral strategy and the Canada-EU strategic partnership on raw materials. Thank you. And I see in, in typical government policy fashion, I'm the only one that came with slides today, so uh, <laughs> bear with me. But. Uh, <laughs> here to talk to you about uh, Canada's critical mineral strategy that we launched in December and also um, the Canada EU strategic partnership on raw materials. Thank you for the introduction. So as a, a refresh, I'm with Natural Resources Canada in the land and mineral sector and I work in International Affairs and Trade Division and worked closely with the European Commission to establish the um, Canada-EU Strategic Partnership on Raw Materials. In our sister division within, our, within the land and mineral sector is the Critical Mineral Centre of Excellence who developed the Critical Mineral Strategy that I'll share some details on today. So the context we're all very familiar with, the demand for critical minerals is forecast to skyrocket in the years ahead. Critical minerals are the base inputs to electric vehicles, batteries, and advanced manufacturing sectors, clean energy, information, and communication technology, and defense applications. Um, global critical minerals are concentrated and vulnerable, as we all know and we've heard today. Um, critical global mineral markets have been seriously impacted in recent years, adding to price volatility and creating bottlenecks in supply chains. Production of many energy transition minerals are more geographically concentrated than oil or natural gas. And reliance on non-like-minded states for supply of minerals and processing contributes to this vulnerability. Canada is uniquely positioned as a mineral-rich country. We have many of the critical minerals needed for the green transition, as well as clean energy resources. We have mining expertise, advanced technologies, and manufacturing capabilities. This presents an opportunity for Canada to play a leadership role with key allies, especially the European Union, to strengthen critical minerals along the value chain in Canada and globally with like-minded international partners for extraction to processing, to manufacturing of products, including batteries. Based on analysis to date, among the critical minerals essential for these priority supply chains, six hold significant potential for Canadian economic growth. These are lithium, graphite, nickel, cobalt, copper, and rare earth elements. As you can see from the map, Canada has a number of high potential critical mineral rich regions Taking a regional approach will facilitate the integration of Canada's rural, remote, and northern regions into the green energy transition. It will allow investment into areas like infrastructure to build on and connect to existing activities in this area. Allow multiple projects to benefit from investment and allow for the development of supply chain corridors connecting mining operations in the north with processing hubs further south and it will encourage resource pooling and crowding in investment from provinces and territories in the private sector. 
Canada's Critical Mineral Strategy. It was launched in December of this past year, and it covers a range of industrial activities under six areas of focus, which you can see on the slide, driving research, innovation, exploration to better target resource potential and deposits and stimulate investment, accelerating project development for Canada's critical minerals, mining, processing, material inputs, and relying recycling projects to support our transition to green and digital economy. Advancing Indigenous reconciliation through access to capital, meaningful participation in critical mineral projects, and associate business opportunities. Growing a diverse workforce by promoting the contribution of diverse workers to Canada's green energy transition as part of the critical minerals workforce and building sustainable infrastructure that connects communities with critical minerals development opportunities. And lastly, strengthening global leadership and security by developing resilient global supply chains shielded from market disruption while enhancing Canada's economic and national security. On this slide here, you can see highlighted some of the investment in the recent, bu recent two budgets. So budget 2022 proposed up to 3.8 billion over eight years to implement the strategy. The funding covers a range of industrial activities from geoscience exploration to mineral processing, manufacturing and recycling applications, including support for research development and technological deployment. I won't go through all the elements, but included is 70 million for global partnerships to promote Canadian mining leadership and up to 1.5 billion for infrastructure development for critical mineral supply chains with a focus on priority deposits. In addition to the strategy and the 2022 budget, budget 2023 proposes a new clean technology manufacturing tax credit that will help spur the expansion of mining and processing of critical minerals, making more raw materials available for clean technologies such as batteries and solar panels. This allows producers from lithium, lithium from brines to issue flow through shares and expand the eligibility of the critical mineral exploration tax credit to lithium from brines. This also provides additional funding to the Strategic Innovation Fund, which is known as the CEF announced and we also announced the government's intention to introduce legislation by 2024 to eradicate forced labor from Canadian supply chains and strengthen the import ban on goods produced using forced labor. Driving broader industrial transformation in collaboration with federal departments including ISAD, Innovation Science Economic Development Canada the strategy will focus on three priority value chains, clean technology, semiconductors, and information communication technologies, and advanced manufacturing inputs and materials. Opportunities exist to ramp up production and processing of additional critical minerals for industrial value chains strategic to Canada and its partners, whether mined or mined and processed in Canada. Now on to the Canada-EU strategic partnership on raw materials, a topic I'm very familiar with. We established this in 2021 and very proud to be one of the first partnerships developed with the EU. And it's established within the mandate of CETA and particularly the bilateral dialogue on raw materials. The overarching objective of the partnership is to advance the value, security and sustainability of trade and investment into the critical minerals and metals needed for the transition to a clean and digital economy. So we have three areas of cooperation under this partnership, including integration of raw material value chains, science, technology and innovation cooperation, and cooperation in international fora and ESG standards. The term integration is important here. We are focused on bringing together projects both in Canada and the EU as opposed to supplying raw materials. So we're building projects where we're working together, Canadian and EU. The importance of this ongoing partnership was highlighted um, during the President uh, von der Leyen's recent visit to Canada. 
Canada also has ongoing bilateral engagement with Germany through the Canada-Germany Energy Partnership, which we recently added critical minerals collaboration to last year. So I see this is a bit of a dense slide, but it highlights a lot of the work that we've done under the strategic partnership in the first slightly over a year. The uh, first year of the partnership delivered many successful engagement activities, including B2B networking events, policy coll collaboration, and research and innovation exchanges. There were several project announcements in the first year, both in EU and in Canada, highlighting potential to further secure supply chains between Canada and the EU. A few examples include Umicor announced plans to build a factory near Kingston, Neo Performance Materials received a grant from Europe Just Transition Fund to construct a permanent magnet plant in Estonia, and last year German car makers Volkswagen and Mercedes-Benz signed battery materials cooperation agreements in Canada last August. And of course, we're all very excited about the recent announcement um, from Volkswagen and PowerCo to build Canada's largest, build the largest gigafactory in St. Thomas, Ontario, which is groundbreaking. Activities in the first year of the partnership included virtual roundtables, Canadian critical mineral projects, and initiatives to European partners and connecting Canadians and Europeans. A research innovation exchange took place between CanMet Mining, which is within NRCAN, and European Health Digital Executive Agency, HADEA, which was laying the groundwork for future Canada-EU collaboration under Horizon Europe. We also had a Tracing Net Zero Battery Minerals Seminar in 2021, which we followed up with a second session during Raw Materials Week in Brussels to hear updates on various traceability pilot projects, and we'll continue to track developments in the traceability space and look for opportunities to bring partners together. We have an annual dialogue through our CETA raw, CETA raw materials, which took place last November as well. And the next one will take place coming up during the next BDAC. This brings together EU member states as well as Canadian provinces and territories. And lastly, moving to our action plan for 2022, 2023 and highlighting some of the areas of focus. We'll be planning events and investment seminars to match investors with projects in Canada. We'll be working, continuing to connect with the European Raw Materials Alliance, IRMA, and the European Battery Alliance. And we'll work with EU member states and Canadian provinces and territories to facilitate trade and investment. This includes advancing our bilateral cooperation with Germany under the Energy Partnership and also enhancing our collaboration with France and other interested member states. Continuing to advance joint interests through multilateral fora and our strong work through G7, IEA, and initiatives such as the Mineral Security Partnership. Thank you for your time and I'll hand it back to Andre to highlight um, a few of our R&D plans. So I understand we were a little bit running out of time. So I will. I just wanted to on the R and D uh, flag one uh, interesting part. Uh, earlier this morning, our ambassador it was referred to the Horizon Europe, the European funding uh, fund that funds research, innovation, also for researchers, for for universities, but also for companies. And we have now made more and more what we call targeted calls. So there's currently a call for applications ongoing for. Um, projects in the improvement of extraction of raw materials uh, and the condition to apply is that these projects, these researchers must collaborate with Canada or with Ukraine, so with the two countries with whom we have a strategic partnership in place and that among the consortia that can apply for these funds, there must be also uh, Canadian or Ukrainian entities that are present, so we are really also our research uh, policy is now taking into account all these uh, more geopolitical uh, situations that we have here. So there's a call currently ongoing for, for funding. Uh, it closes, I think, in February, if anybody's interested. Thanks. 
Thank you, Andre. Thank you to both. Of, uh, thanks to both of you for a great discussion and a very informative policy update. We now would like to invite you uh, to our second and last panel of the day on raw materials and sustainability, focused on advancing the EU-Canada strategic partnership on raw materials that Alana and Andre just gave us an update on. I'd like to invite our distinguished panel to take their seats. All right, so I'll start with the introductions. Um, furthest away from me on my left is Alexei Sigal. Alexei is the head of government affairs and communications for Glencore Canada. In this role, he works for Glen Glencore's copper, zinc, and nickel businesses operating in Canada, developing the company's integrated corporate affairs strategy for Canada that is reflective of prioritized business requirements of the seven operating mine and metallurgical sites in Canada. He is also supporting Norfalco, the sulfuric acid business of Glencore, some mining projects, and many legacy operations across North America. Prior to joining Glencore four years ago, Alexei had a career in the marine industry, followed by a 15-year career in the aluminum business, where he had the opportunity to work around the world, but mostly in Europe and Canada, as VP of communications for the aluminum product group of Rio Tinto. Next over is Marilyn Spink, She's a metallurgical and materials process engineering expert who successfully delivered mining and industrial projects around the world using an integrated approach. Marilyn's unique leadership lens, uh, le excuse me, le leadership lens ensures benefits for local communities and, bal and balances complex environmental challenges because what is good for the planet and the people is also good for long-term profit. Marilyn is the recipient of the prestigious United Kingdom WIM 100 Global Inspirational Women in Mining Award. She is also currently serving on the board of directors for both Star Diamonds and Avalon Advanced Materials, a Canadian mineral development company focused on metals and minerals for use in clean energy and new technology. Next over is Ian London, who serves as an executive director of Canadian Critical Min Minerals and Materials Alliance, also known as C2M2A which is an industry-led, multi-stakeholder network that seeks to advance Canada's potential in the global critical material supply market. Ian chaired Canada's seat on the International Standards Organization's Rare Earth Technical Committee, co-chaired Canada's Rare Earth R&D Initiative, and serves on the advisory board of the Global Rare Earth Industry Association. Ian also participated on numerous international panels, appeared before Canada's Natural Resource and Finance Parliamentary Committees, has been an act and has been an active commentator on advanced material supply chain issues for the past decade. And last but not least, to my immediate left is David Anonichak, who is the Global Vice President of Metallurgy, Metallurgy and Consulting at SGS, a leader in metallurgical test work, project development studies, and process plant optimization. David has over 20 years of experience in international mining and metallurgy, working in consulting, strategy, and operations with senior management positions at major metal producers, including Glencore, Extrata, Falcon Bridge, Noranda, and Newmont. David is an expert in critical minerals and battery supply chain, providing valuable insight, having previously spoken at a number of, at a number of prestigious conferences. He also sits on the Canadian Critical Mineral Council under the auspices of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Canadian Critical Minerals and Materials Alliance. Welcome. Now, we've just heard from Alana and Andre uh, about the strategic partnership on raw materials. Turning now to our panel, from the industry perspective, how can the EU-Canada strategic partnership on critical mi minerals support a transition to low carbon economy and what role do raw materials play in this transition? Ian, let's start with you. Good afternoon. Um, actually, it's a great question. I'm gonna take a two second thing. I think we gotta get rid of the word raw material because it's all about raw material supply chains. What industry needs are not only uh, what's out of the ground or reprocessing, but it takes components because end users such as Schneider 
don't buy raw materials. They buy components, they buy motors, or they bring those sources together. It is also not a mining initiative. It's an a reindustrialization for the transition to new economies. So that's to start. How can we bring it together with the EU and Canada? As we heard before, we have natural resources, we have human resources, et cetera. We have to shorten those supply chains and bring the capabilities and capacities together. Europe has uh, a suite of technologies and capabilities and demand. Canada has similar and natural resources. How do we shorten those supply chains, which also improve carbon footprints, and then the reprocessing of such? Thank you, Ian. Marilyn? Um, yeah, I wanted to say I agree governments are pushing, um, but so are consumers and business. Uh, this is actually a Chamber of Commerce event, right? Um, so I would say consumers are demanding transparent reporting of the carbon footprint, and they want to know sort of the ethical sourcing and traceability of materials in the products that they buy. And businesses are actually pushing for a lower carbon economy. We heard it in the business leadership of the previous panel. Um, to mitigate material business risks, risks to their business, but also to seize opportunities in this transition that we're all facing. So um, I actually, you know, I always use the thing, if you can't grow it, it must be mined. I'm a bit of the mining voice. But we also, um, if we want to feed the world, we also need mining. But we do need an industrial transition because I think that Jumping from mines to a product is actually too big of a leap, and we don't talk enough about the midstream. Um, and so what does this strategic partnership look like? I actually think um, it, there needs to be some real tangi tangibles, not just aspirations. <laughs> um, and a possible first step would be ensure there's a, actually a clear vision with a desired and well-articulated outcome of this partnership and a common understanding of what sustainability actually means because that can actually create a lot of tension and I think Perry really aptly pointed that out in his welcoming remarks. Um, once alignment is sort of agreed upon, um, you know, I think there needs to be timelines and actions and reporting on targets and I was happy to hear, um, you know, in the previous uh, discussion on the policy side, seeing maybe some reporting metrics happening. But I think two countries, you know, in partnership have sort of two separate critical mineral strategies, one with a separate industrialization strategy and one without is actually risky for a relationship. And like a marriage, right, if you think about marriages, right, it's a partnership and you need common goals and lots of great communication and alignment on those goals. So the devil's in the details. Thank you, Marilyn. David? Great, thank you. Um, Marilyn, I mean, the last word you said, partnerships is essential. We can't do it alone. Um, there's a lot of different players that are having new relationships. Um, and like I said, uh, reinforce, like I said, partnerships are essential. Um, and if we say, well, what do we need? Um, we really need to accelerate the development of critical mineral projects, battery supply chain, energy supply chain. Um, they are now more interconnected uh, more than ever. Every time we go to a conference, we're now talking about the widest supply chain. It's not just any of us um, in our own supply chains. Like I said, we're, we're all connected. We heard um, Alana talk about the need on the, on the mining side in terms of the number of mines the growth that's needed, and it does present us with a challenge in industry because there is a risk of supply um, challenges in these commodities. And it means we need aggressive mine development just to help on the front end of that, let alone the energy that we're also going to need in this transition. Um, I will say um, I was in Ottawa this week um, with the um, Deputy Minister of Finance. He, was, he attended a lunch. And he told us, uh, so uh, Michael Sabia, and he told the crowd, um, the concern in Canada is having enough um, electricity, um, energy for this transformation. And if we look in the long term, what are we going to need from a, a minerals point of view? We're going to need 50 to 60 million tons per year uh, of mineral production um, just to meet these long-term net zero 2050 objectives and where are they going to come from and it's not just mining um, that's maybe analysts are saying that's 50 percent of the future market we're going to need recycling that's going to make up maybe about 40 percent of that and then 
another 10% will come from new new materials and new elements um, based on technology and innovation. So there's a lot to do. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, David. Uh, Alexi? Hello. Uh, Glencore is a European-based company with huge assets in uh, Ontario and, and Quebec, mostly in the, coal, in, in the nickel, uh, copper, and zinc business. Uh, one thing that we, we need, I think, to, to acknowledge is our challenges are quite the same. You know, I was looking at the Germany portfolio of energy. There's something like 25% that is uh, 24 or 23% that is low carbon. Canada is exactly the same number, uh, one or two percent. So there, one of the challenge that we have at the moment is everybody's focusing on the critical mineral for the battery. But if we have to replace all this carbon uh, energy, 75%, we will need windmill, we need transportation line, we will need uranium mining or uh, uh, nuclear power, we need a solar panel, and that's a lot of minerals. The other topic that I would like to raise is we in Canada and Europe have the same uh, counter to appetite on mining and we tend to overestimate the footprint of mining. You know, in Canada, just the parking lots of the shopping malls have a bigger footprint than the, all the mining industry in Canada. So we need to stop, uh, make it the mining, the, the, the devil, it's the solution. This city around us is full of mining products. We're, in, we're not in a building if there's not miners working in mines. Thank you, Alexi. Thank you, everyone. A very insightful comments on this question. Um, I think you already covered a lot of what I was going to ask next, but uh, just, just to be sure, um, in, do you have any additional comments on specifically what our Canadian raw materials sector can do to advance the strategic partnership, thereby advancing the transition to low-carbon economy? David, let's start with you. Yeah, I have two comments on that. Um, and the first one, goes back to that participation aspect. And, and I'm glad we're all here today to discuss this because again, we're all different stakeholders in different parts of supply chain. We all have a role in what we do. And we need to be talking about this openly. Um, and like I said, look at where those gaps and challenges are. So again, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for everyone in attendance. Um, and I'll just say something more specific to the business that I am in at, at SGS. We need to advance from uh, research and development point of view, we need to advance um, collaborative projects. And I'll give you a much more um, perfect example. Working on a um, lithium project in Europe, we were doing the development with our technical team in Canada, but because of the EU funding, the client said, okay, now we're gonna do 100% of the work in Europe. But we're losing that collaborative um, idea of it has to be a binary decision where only one team, whether it's Canada, or you know, EU team are working on it. We are gonna run out of um, good technical people in the future with all this growth, right? And we so therefore the incentives in terms of policy need to be collaborative, where we can share in the benefits, share in the technical team. So that, that's my one comment. So there shouldn't be a, um, a decision, are we only doing it in Canada or are we only doing it in EU? We have to rethink that. And, and there was some, uh, uh, some things presented today talking about that collaboration. I just hope we accelerate that. Thank you, David. Alexi? Uh, I would complete the first comment of David. You know, um, Canada has plenty of mining potential. Europe has plenty of urban mining potential. A and we need to stop thinking about ways. We need to think about end-of-life product. A and it's important that we work together. And I will give you an example, for example, of uh, our uh, copper uh, foundry that we have in the northern Quebec. We are the biggest recycler of what we call e-scrap. Uh, uh, but at the same time, our governments tend to consider limiting the movement of scrap. But it's not scrap. There's a lot of value, and we need to shift our mindset from what is a product at the end of the life and what is scrap or uh, uh, waste. Sorry, that's the word I was looking for. Product and waste, and, and if, if it has a value, it's a product. If you're paid to take something, it's a waste. And I think our, our legislation 
need to change their mindset on this. Because if we need to move to the recycling in, uh, economy, we need to change our mindset also on what is a waste, what is a product. Marilyn? Um, I'm just going to sort of echo collaboration to me is the only way because not one person or one company or one country has all the answers anymore. And partnerships are based on building and maintaining trust. And, um, well, s sustainable partnerships, right? We keep using that word. But I would say that I, there was concern that, you know, we might end up competing with each other. But in marriages and partnerships, do people actually compete with each other? Right? It's not, um, that's not sustainable. And so I think um, there, what is needed too is to define a value framework for the partnership. And I see that, you know, EU is very strong on the environmental side. Like single-use plastics, when you go to Europe, like they're gone. Um, not here in North America. And Canada is very strong on the social side and with our UNDRIP, the United Nations uh, Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People and some of the, rec you know, the economic and Indigenous reconciliation we've done with our Indigenous people. So we are all learning and this, is, this transformation is presenting huge opportunities. Um, and I think there's more than enough work to do so that we don't actually need to be competing with each other. And if we actually map where the gaps are and point businesses to where opportunities are so we can kind of cover these gaps, we have a hope and heck of sort of solving this problem that humanity is facing. So um, I think if you, know, you take the technical know-how and the finance and business strengths from each country, um, it's the potential for a very, very powerful partnership. And, but we need actions and we need timelines. Um, as they say, what is it? The total is greater than the sum of the individual parts. Excellent observation. And Ian? This one, yes. Uh, I'll be quick. Two points. One, it's not just waste products waste and recycling. There are secondary sources. We have been a mining and a processor. There are tailings, ponds galore. The rock is out of the... And the technology advances. You're right, we threw it away because we didn't even know what was in it. We just didn't need the primary source. Those should be open. Regulatory changes required, dealings with well-established uh, countries or companies saying, you know, don't touch that tailings pond. Well, that was yesterday's story. We do have to work through that. And the technologies which reside elsewhere, bring them in. The other one builds on the point that David raised. Uh, we can't do it all. Uh, <clears throat> so many European companies are further advanced on be it solar panel or wind turbine. Why are Canadians trying to design this? <laughs> the Europeans should be allowed to practice here, build it. Maybe we relocate their operations. Because as we said before, if we shorten the supply chain lines, and it's all about chain. We talked about this, we talked about that. They're all interconnected, which says chain. Uh, let the Europeans do this. We are, we're more in the mining. You're opening up 10%, 20% new facilities. Canadians have been known to be the miners and metallurgists of the world. Easy access, and I was pleased to hear that kind of remark. Thank you, Ian. So if, I'm, if I were to summarize the overarching theme, it is collaboration. Collaboration, it seems to be the answer to advancing the strategic partnership. Now, next I'd like to circle back to something that David, you mentioned, uh, but I'll go to Marilyn on that first. Um, you mentioned that um, we potentially would need tens of millions of tons of materials to be extracted to achieve our net zero goals by 2050. And there are some estimates suggesting that there might not simply be enough material in the ground to support our transition to a fully electrified economy. Is there concern that we might be overly aspirational in our transition to a low carbon economy? And if that's the case, how can the raw materials industry best navigate those concerns? Marilyn. Well, I want to kind of go back to one of the previous um, panels said, we all need to consume less, right? And I think there's us, you know, sort of the circular economy they are talking about. My kids shop at Value Village. They, they don't go to the mall and buy new clothes anymore. They think that's, you know, the sort of the right thing. So um, I also questioning some of the assumptions about the material um, demand as we move sort of through, you know, through this sharing economy. Um, Again, I, I, I actually feel that the assumption that vehicles will be replaced one for one is actually flawed. Because I don't know very many young people that want their own individual cars. They like Ubers, and so how many people use an Uber? Um, 
but I see the now challenges of navigating this energy transition is mainly related to the protection of the materials needed, this, this midstream. And it's the doing, not the talking, right? And the doing should be mapped as part of the development of any kind of plans, whether it's two businesses collaborating with each other or governments collaborating with each other or chamber of commerce is <laughs> you know, collaborating with each other. And the plan should leverage the existing strengths of each partners and identify growth areas needed by the partners. I really think that's, um, you know, to, to actually fill the gaps, and I don't use the term supply chain because that's too simplistic. This is complex. It's going to be hard work. It's a supply net. It's like the internet, and it's very complex, and we're working within a system. And so we need to kind of figure out what is tr strategic um, and, and measure against those plans. And I, I actually think the biggest challenge that we have, if we all of a sudden had Vince investment and everybody played nice with each other, where is our build, you know, our capability to build the talent that is ne needed? And I actually, you know, s my son just got a job with Tesla and he's going to be working in Austin and they have recruited him eight months before they need him as a student. I can't believe what they threw at him, gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. And I think he's U.S. bound, yet he was educated in Canada. What's going to happen with the brain drain that's going to happen, right? He will never come back. Austin, Texas, he's a musician too on the side. He's never coming back. So guess where I might be retiring, right? So I think we need to look at these materials as they're not commodities. They're specialized materials uh, for particular applications. And it's where mining meets the chemical industry. And I'm sorry I took your, I love that, Dave. Uh, Dave introduced me to that. And we need to figure this out together. Thank you, Marilyn. Let's move over to, the, over to Dave. To come back to that, I mean, uh, what do we need to do to change? And uh, I'll make a comment that thankfully, um, you know, during COVID, it seems like things accelerated um, in terms of, uh, we look at a movement away from ICE vehicles, right? We had a lot of countries in Europe saying, we're gonna uh, move faster to the adoption of electric vehicles as an example. We needed that policy, um, uh, regulatory legislation to create a vision for the future. Um, and we saw that happen in US and Canada as well. Um, and, and then we had, you know, individual companies too giving their vision of a future. I'll give an example. Um, Tesla came out with their, in March, their latest, um, I think it's called the Master Plan 3. It's a document where they say here is the entire um, uh, energy supply and their vision. They're saying today it's wasteful and here's their vision for the future. It's not just about electric, ve electric vehicles, it's the entire energy supply chain. And so we need the leadership, whether it's governments and, and large companies, um, to create that vision for us to go there. On, on the other side, the market forces will navigate supply and demand and market prices. You know, commodity prices will go up and down to, to help um, bring on supply on or not. So I don't, I'm not worried about will we have enough. Leave that to the market forces. But we need the leadership to have the vision. Thank you, David. Ian? Actually, an interesting... Every one of these questions is fascinating, and I can't wait for the audience conversation. We've got to get on with it. We're, we're, tr we're trying to, and I appreciate the comments about the strategy and the framework, etc. You know why we're doing this? The East and China are actually building further futures. Their future, for, for, for we should have to start building ours. I am greatly appreciative, and I think it's a brilliant move for Volkswagen to build a battery plant. The concern I have is by the time we build the plant and start feeding it, that won't be the technology because it'll be solid state batteries or next generation. And to what extent are we doing that next generation? And that comes out of collaborative work done by the engineers, the scientists, the trades folks who are actually building them who have these ideas. So there is a certain uh, desire. We've been having these conversations in this country for 15 years. Rare Earths is not a new story. It became a big issue in 2010, 2012, when China and Japan got into that. The lithium batteries, we've been talking lithium for a long time. Well, our time is here and we've got to get on with it. So it's, uh, if there's anything about collaboration, I agree with you. We need some timelines, but they're not long. 
for us to demonstrate that we can actually do this. Because once we, well, even EVs, I think, is, yeah, EVs is tomorrow and EVs are coming. And now that it's reached this, what's it, 5% uh, adoption rate? Now they're, you know, it's reached a, uh, uh, the transition point. We're not quite there yet, and we've got to get on with it to meet that future demand. Thank you, Ian. So it, it sounds like when it comes to meeting uh, challenges with meeting our net zero goal by 2050, the answer really lies across two dimensions. One is, as Marilyn said, the demand may not be there, and we can't assume that the demand will continue to grow into the future. And the second part of the equation, on the supply side, we really have to step up to our game, stop the brain drain, engage in strategic collaboration, and cut through the gridlock and get things done. Um, Next, next question I have for the panel is, what are some of the steps or solutions that the industry can uh, pursue to assure the public that they're delivering on their commitments for transitioning to a low carbon economy? I think we covered some of that already in the previous question, but I'd like to open up the floor to that as well. Alexei, let's start with you. <coughs> um, companies like us, you know, we, we made pledge to get uh, zero carbon 2050, uh, and, but we need to start moving now. And to do that, I think the recycling part is a commitment that we are taking in Glencore. The lucky that we are is the fact that we are a huge mining and processing business, but also a huge uh, trading business. And at the junction of the two, we have this uh, recycling business that we are investing heavily in it. At the moment, it's only a 200 million EBITDA business, but at the size of mining is small, but it's a by itself is a big business in itself. So we need to continue to focus on that. We need to develop uh, what I said, uh, urban mining as uh, something that is forefront of our, uh, so we, we don't want to be only a mining company, we want to be a recycling company. Thank you, Alexi. Marilyn? Um, yeah, I think the industry needs to actually accelerate the adoption of transparent integrated reporting of both, you know, sort of the financial and non-financial material issues for their business. And, you know, I've got my board of directors hat on here. Um, and I think boards of directors can really push their organizations that they oversee. Um, because investors, you're not going to build the industry without investors. or And you're not going to sell anything without consumers. And so I actually think that that is, you know, this is the expectation of the, inv you know, investment industry now. And the sustainable development, um, you know, of raw materials uh, is needed for the energy transition. And sometimes people say it's, a, it's an or, like I can protect the environment or produce my product. But it, to me, it's an and. And uh, I don't know if many of you in the room uh, last month, the Inter uh, Canadian, the inaugural Canadian Sustainability Standards Board under um, IFRS was created. And the accountants are showing tremendous leadership. And business needs to show tremendous leadership. Um, you know, I'm seeing that in the previous panel. Um, this industry that we are trying to build, um, you know, if it's good for people and planet, it is really good for long-term profit. This is a business opportunity. And we need to begin in, with the end in mind. We need to use holistic sort of design thinking. What are the outcomes that we want? Thank you, Marilyn. Ian? Uh, interesting, because some of the points have already been. We also need a longer, although I talk about immediate action, we also need a longer term horizon from a, from a, a European, North American perspective. The minute the Chinese drop their price in half, no disrespect to the Glencores, your board's going to say, when do I drop this? Why should I invest more? And that's where a role for government. We're going to have to unwrite the, un underwrite some of this transition, as our friends at Neo Performance Materials at one point in time articulated. The Chinese or the Japanese, they've been doing this stuff for 30 years. They didn't build this industry yesterday. So we have an immediate challenge of getting on with it to secure the West and, and robust supply chain, at the same time requiring a broader perspective. Transparency is fundamentally important, where we're going, and the ability to see through some downturns. We're going to have downturns. Welcome to the, the stock markets, et cetera. So it's not a short-term uh, business retail investor, which tends to be in the critical material side. This is a broader uh, industrial re, uh, reindustrialization for uh, a better future for my grandchildren. I don't plan on seeing much of that. 2030, thank you for the good birthday wishes. <laughs> 
well, maybe maybe all live to 100 years. Uh, so it sounds like the way that uh, the, the industry can assure that it's delivering on its commitments is recognizing and identifying the business opportunity that lies in the transition to low carbon economy, being transparent and reporting on it and sticking with it for the long run, despite the short term challenges. Um, moving on to um, opportunities in the sector as opposed to the challenges that we've spent the last 10 minutes on, I think everyone in this room will agree that Canada has enormous potential when it comes to contributing to the global critical supply chain. In your view, where do potential, most of the potential opportunities for collaboration with the European Union lie? We talk about collaboration generally, now let's talk about some specific areas where uh, there is greatest promise for collaboration. Ian, let's start with you. Um, energy production we talked about in terms of energy efficient technologies. Because we, 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 we sit and talk about, oh, digitalization. You know, digitalization is all hard. You know, there's computers down in the basement here which run it. Guess what built it? Materials. So we need to get the energy sector going. It's not we can't do it all. Europeans can, can, can clearly assist. We have regulatory improvements which need to be streamlined. From a government or an industry perspective, we have to pick our own favorite projects and get them going. We, we, when the market gets robust, everybody's pitching. Look at the opportunity. We can't, industry has to, with all due respect, pick its own winners and losers. Not suggesting they're losers, but what's our nearer term priority? Uh, I, would, I, I have actually argued at one point in time is how, to, how can Glencore help the smaller folks by hiring the next 10 tra or 100 trades uh, operating folks, engineers. So when that lithium mine actually opens, they have trained resources to run them. The juniors or the, the smaller companies don't have that capacity or the Europeans have that capacity. Because at the end of the day, especially on a critical material front, these newer materials, the customer defines their needs. It's not about lithium supply because nobody buys lithium. They buy lithium chemicals. They buy anodes and cathodes. What are those demands and can they integrate into the process to help the, uh, accelerate the development of both the mine and it's down and it's down more downstream, midstream and downstream processing. Thank you, Ian. David? Um, to continue on that, um, one of the things I already talked about is in terms of, um, you know, the opportunities for collaboration and it's what I said before on R&D projects. We, we need to share the benefits with our technical teams between Canada and the EU, not create barriers because it, you have to make a, ch a choice where there's only it's a binary decision. It's only you know, one versus the other. So um, we have to move in that collaborative direction. The other aspect goes back to capital markets um, because we work with a lot of junior mining companies and technology companies. And even in the current market, depending on the risk out there, they can't necessarily raise all the funds necessary because they're early stage. And there is some uh, you know, inherent risk in that, but there's a lot of opportunity to unlock value because we're gonna need those technology partners. So there's two things that comes to mind. It's both the project financing aspect to add in that extra layer of capital. Um, you know, and that's usually something big, you know, that's where governments can look at, you know, big, large project financing um, at uh, current market rates. But on the other side, I'll say government funding, which allows companies to apply for, you know, funding that they get to keep. Um, it's not a loan. I've seen that work in Canada with some of our clients. Um, at our major mining conference in Toronto recently in March, um, it's it's PDAC for some of those who, who know it. Um, the Canadian government um, granted $14 million of, of funding for six mining uh, projects. And that made a huge difference. That allowed them to advance their projects. And as a company that works with those companies, obviously we benefit because we can help them accelerate their projects and help them de-risk their projects. So things that go directly to others on the early stage makes a huge difference. Thank you, David. It goes straight back to Andre's comments on uh, the EU legislation, the new legislation framework allowing access to capital for projects that are deemed uh, critical. So there is a, a potential opportunity for capital through that framework once it gets implemented. 
Last question on challenges and opportunities. I wanted to uh, put uh, to a couple members of the panel who have particular experience in project development, Marilyn and Alexi, is this. We know that one of the most pressing challenges in the mining industry is ensuring that our resources are extracted and developed in a responsible manner. As I'm sure our audience here will agree, a responsible development entails not only protection of the environment, but also ensuring that mining projects accrue benefits to all appropriate stakeholders. Based on your experience, can you share with us some of the solutions that you have seen or perhaps personally developed over your time in the industry? Let's start with you, Marilyn. Um, you know, I, I might take a little bit longer with this question, but, you know, some people say that mining is not sustainable, but I, I look at Sudbury, Ontario, and 100 years ago and look at it now, and it has, you know, educational institutions, medical facilities, research, thriving manufacturing, a culture, you know, uh, that's there as well, and it's a, you know, it's a lovely place to live. And so I see sustainability from that. And, um, you know, I... I want to talk about where responsible needs to be defined, and I think it is with the international sustainability standards. Um, but, you know, we need to look at, we looked at innovation, and I also see innovation as not necessarily technical, but social innovation is actually an untapped opportunity um, f to do things responsibly. And most mines in Canada actually are located for, uh, near First Nations, Métis, you know, Inuit communities. And I see mining as a social development tool. And again, there's huge opportunities for social innovation. And so one of the examples that I, you know, I look at is it, if you think about a project owner, they're trying to reduce their capital costs because they're trying to get invested and they're trying to build something. And often we put a lot of the infrastructure on the back of the project. But if we're thinking about economic reconciliation, we can actually carve out the power plant. I'm tired of seeing mines close and then the local communities, because the mine built the power plant, the power, they lose their power, right? That's how ghost towns are created. So the power plant or the water treatment facility, these can be carved off the project by offering the ownership to indigenous communities. And so they design, they build capacity with their own community for all those jobs and the education around it and the profits. And there's, you know, the project owner ends up becoming a customer who just signs an offtake agreement for this kind of water or this, this kind of power. So it, res it really re results in a reduced capital cost for the project. And there's lots of other intangible benefits um, to doing things like that because you're actually embedding sort of indigenous into your business model. Another example, you know, I think about um, uh, the social is about tailings. Everybody talks about tailings. And yes, there's a lot of tailings out there that we can reap the benefits like um, uh, Ian mentioned. But how about just designing a process that doesn't produce tailings? Begin with the end in mind. Waste is a design flaw, right, Alex? Mm -hmm. Right? It can be a product for somebody else's. Um, the other thing we haven't talked about is small modular reactors. Um, diesel, so many remote communities are on diesel engines, right? So SMRs will actually help with the um, uh, energy transition. And I haven't heard a lot of people talk about nuclear power, good old nuclear, right? It's, I, I think it's, an un, it's actually going to be a hero in our energy transition. So I did work in a project in just as a last... Um, comment uh, at the Cereals Minerals Project in the UK. And it was the first mine to be developed in the UK in 40 years, and it was built under a national park. Can you imagine doing that under Algonquin in Canada here, right? But we actually used design thinking and design constraints, and the community said they had a huge youth unemployment problem, but they didn't want to ruin the tourism industry that they had. So we made the decision that nothing would come to surface. So, and the park authority had to approve all the coatings and the, and, and the architecture of all the buildings. So it looks like the workers go into an, an old Yorkshire Highland farmhouse. All their cars are parked behind berms. The tourists don't see anything. It had to remain green. And not one piece of mineral comes up to the surface and it is in a gets transported to the coast in a 40 kilometer underground mineral transport tunnel and it was appropriate 
low risk technology because England had just come off the Channel Project and all the upgrades that they had done on the tube in London. And so the capacity of the technical people that was there to do it. And it worked like a charm. And um, you know they're producing polyhalite uh, there. But what was another benefit was they had an old steel plant that was not hadn't been closed properly. Uh, I think there might have been coke ovens and and it was sort of abandoned. And so the owner actually got the property if they promised to remediate it properly. So the local community at the coast where the mineral transport tunnel comes out, they got refurbished industrial site. They got an improved harbor, and it was just like a win 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 because you began with the end in mind and sat down and thought, what are the outcomes we want for this project? Thank you, Marilyn. These are some excellent, excellent examples. So begin with an end in mind, and I'd, and I'd add, think outside of the box is what is the common denominator behind those examples. Alexi, why don't you share your experience with I us? I would simply add, because the example are super good, the, the example of our Raglan mine in the top of Quebec, you know, uh, with... Uh, we, we achieve you know, uh, uh, the first impact and benefit agreement with the Inuit population there uh, for 25 years. Uh, there was part of sharing the profit that is super important, but most important is the employment. And uh, now we reach 20%. It's, it's not enough because at the end, what we want to achieve is 100%. And we need to put ourselves with enough ambition that the end end game is not having a manager of Raglan that is Inuit. The end game is having uh, Inuit managing a Sudbury mine or a, a Kazakhstan mine. You know, and, and, and having a lot of ambition is necessary to be able to share the benefit long term. And, and I think that's what the most important for mining is to be able to invest on the long term because indeed when mine close we need to have a lasting legacy that is positive, not only tailings <laughs> or... <laughs> and that, of course, will go a long way towards addressing pub public perception concerns with the mining industry. As, uh, as uh, was just uh, mentioned, not everybody's aware that parking lots occupy more area land area than mines in Canada. All right, we're running a little short on time, and I'd like to give our uh, audience an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so why don't we skip ahead and open up the floor to our audience. Please go ahead. I had pre-knowledge of these topics, so uh, <laughs> I will kick off. Uh, very exciting. Um, I think one of the benefits of things like we do today is the, and I and I think for many of the people joining, is the cross-domain knowledge sharing. And so, so for me personally, I've 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 learned a tremendous amount, and um, I I think more of this has to happen. I, I think there was a conversation about collaboration. It's not just collaboration between business and government, Europe and Canada, but also collaboration within the supply net and with consumers and uh, and demand. My my question. I heard it touched on a couple times. One of the things that we hear a lot from from our members at the U Chamber is around labor mobility. We heard a little bit about brain drain. We heard a little bit about binary uh, labor kind of choices. But could you share any positive or negative kind of thoughts around uh, labor mo mobility, and particularly in terms of um, between Europe and, and Canada? I, I can make a general comment about, let's say, labor. Um, just because of the increase in demand for these critical mineral projects, we have to hire more people. And we have a, a, a large technical center in Canada. We have also uh, technical centers in other countries. But specifically, um, a lot of the critical mineral work that we do, battery and, and rare earth work is done in Canada. And sometimes we just can't find enough technical people because there's competition between us, who's on the, let's say, the lab side where we're helping our clients develop the process and extract the minerals. But then we have the mining companies who are also scaling up because they're producing more and we're fighting for the same shared resources. So we have to look internationally to hire people and bring them over to Canada. And sometimes because of the approval process or the, the process to, to, to bring people to Canada, it's too long. 
and we lose them. And they say, sorry, I waited six months, I waited nine months, and since my visa is not here, I took another job somewhere else. So we're losing those opportunities. So that's a big factor, um, I'll say, uh, is accelerating and getting people from um, other countries to come to Canada or go to U EU, that's a big issue. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment that in my volunteer time, I've spent quite a bit of time um, in professional self-regulation on the council. And um, recently, the government of Ontario, and I, this is a small microcosm because I've got my engineering hat on, um, they've enacted legislation called the Fair Access to the Regulated Professions because that was actually seen as a barrier for um, t international talent coming in and then they can't work in the operating rooms or you know, do engineering design because their qualifications are not recognized by industry. So I'm actually going to see that change. I'm seeing that change. And it's, it's, um, I think that would be a benefit for where we need to get all this talent because the problem is technical that we're trying to solve. As the son of uh, two Russian-educated engineers, I wanted to say this is an excellent, excellent, long overdue development. Add some of that. We also have to develop our own. And we have not done enough, be it at the high school or college or trade schools, of attracting or cultivating that talent pool. So yes, we could bring folks in. But if you ask uh, a young I want to go into IT and do d design apps and make movies, et cetera. Canada has lost some of that. And we've got to develop the programs. Between Canada, Europe, I know we actually put together a, a rare earth processing multi-day program actually funded by NATO. Whole course materials not picked up by any school or university. We delivered it to some of the industry players, et cetera. So materials around, and then how do we encourage more folks to get into this sector? It doesn't necessarily have the panache of, uh, of tomorrow or, or as they see the world. They don't even know what their cell phone came out of uh, from underground. They have no clue. But how do we start cultivating and building that? And I think we have the, the course material. We just don't necessarily have the education process. So I think we have to hit it on multiple fronts. Any other questions? Thanks. One, one thing that comes to me, I'm a resident of Ontario, and I've seen the Ring of Fire for uh, talked about for a long time. And I'm just wondering about the rest of Canada. Is it as problematic? I mean, I saw the map that you had up there. And is it as problematic in the rest of Canada as it seems to be the Ring of Fire? I mean, I understand that there's a lot of government money that's going to have to go in there before you're going to get private sector in. And is that pretty going to be pretty common across Canada? Massive government uh, um, money prior, you know, getting the infrastructure in place before the private sector comes in. Thank you. Uh, I can comment. I've worked in Northern Ontario. I've worked in Northern Quebec. And um, sometimes there's federal policies that help with in infrastructure, but the provincial policies matter quite a bit because having spent time in both provinces, um, there's a big difference between what Quebec's doing, that they're more visible, they're more upfront about their battery supply chain. So it goes all the way back to mining, production of electric vehicles and recycling. I've been to, in the last six months, two Quebec government-led conferences in that area, and they're out front, they're speaking, and it's, and it's not necessarily the same in the different provinces. That's one aspect of it, is getting the visibility. Um, but you've got to build that infrastructure. There's projects where there's geologists that will say, well, there's no roads, it's two hours away from anything, so I'm just going to give up. It's a beautiful potential, but I'm not going to drill here because there's no infrastructure. So that's what makes a big difference. So in Ontario, we need the roads um, just to get access. And if that was one thing, that would make a huge difference. Prioritize, prioritize another project and not necessarily the Ring of Fire, because the Ring of Fire has been talked about for decades, and might, you know, it may be the future, and might always be the future. There are other projects which have lost uh, uh, the attention, 
which could be brought in further recycling facilities, et cetera. The whole what's going on around the Kingston area would be at the graphite recycling folks, the, uh, the Kingston process, who are advancing technologies. Well, let's pick one or the other. One's long, one's near, and we have to make those trade-offs. Just add a, a little example of that. You know, uh, we, are, we are operated a mine in Matagami, and uh, that's the end of the railway. And I had a chat with uh, the, the Cree representatives there. And they told me, you know, Alexi, mines are not where our deposit, it's where infrastructure are. So if we decide where the frontiers go, we will see where the mine will go. And I think their, you know, their, their sight of line is 50 years, which we live in a, a year. But they were, they were right. Mine are not where the deposits are, where the infrastructure are. Thank you. We have only a couple minutes left, so I'd like to skip ahead to a similar speed round to what Claire did in the morning. And I'd like to close off the panel discussion by asking each of our panelists for an insight or a question you would like our audience to reflect on after today's conversation. Let's start with you, Marilyn. So, um I see everybody in this room a leader. The fact that you actually took the time to you know, attend today means you want to learn. So if we keep looking to others to solve this collective problem humanity is facing, governments, for example, I think people often point to government. And you know, government can facilitate, but they don't have the capacity. They're not big enough. So I see this as uh, the transition to you know, a low-carbon economy uh, may not be fast enough if we don't start to sort of looking in the mirror and saying, what, what can I do? What can I do as a business leader? And so I'm reflecting on my behavior more and more. And um, what I would say is we need to look at things differently. Think about who we as humans consume, for example, which may t make people uncomfortable. Um, but I think we, you know, it's the definition of insanity to keep doing the same thing and expect different results, right? Isn't that, I think that Einstein said that. Uh, we need to start being comfortable with being uncomfortable and to, to actually have these difficult conversations with our colleagues when you're collaborating. It's like a family. You put each other in, a, in your place, right? But it's all done with love, <laughs> right? So um, I really think that these, you know, transformational changes are needed by business and humans to really actually meaningful meet the carbon reduction goals. And there's a lot of greenwashing out there right now. And I'm convinced mining and min minerals and the technical talent will save the planet. Great comment. Alexi? Uh, when I, I look at the history of the EU, you know, it's the European steel and coal community, the ancestor. So it's not a critical metal it's it, it, they change in time. You know, there was the Bronze Age, if you remember, uh, from our. <laughs> no, no, you don't. Okay, <laughs> but, but you know, it 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 always been there. We need to 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 adapt and to be really hands on and take the challenge. Thank you, David. I'm just going to give an example of um, a project that I worked on in Ukraine in in graphite. And this was about uh, three years ago. And to give you an example of collaborative approach, we had our geology and mining team in Canada. We had our project management and engineering team out of the UK and our process development team and also uh, engineering team in Germany. So it took um, all of those different offices to coordinate and work with this uh, graphite deposit in Ukraine to help advance the technology. So like I said, it was true c collaboration. Thank you. Ian, last words? I never get a laugh. I want to circle around to our opening speakers and our guest speakers from uh, the, the, uh, their excellencies, or I probably got all the, the, the words wrong. I think Canada, EU, be bold, be confident, be collaborative, and we shall succeed. They have demonstrated we can do it ourselves. So uh, let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank our distinguished panel for dedicating their time today to share their insights with us. I'd also like to uh, thank Andre and Alana for a very informative policy update. 
Let's give one more round of applause for everybody on the critical raw materials end. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass the microphone back to Adrian, our president, to close out our proceedings. So um, I will give you my thanks and invite you all to stay and join us for a networking lunch. We really hope that those will, um, if you stay, you'll, uh, we'll be able to broker some impactful introductions for you. And I will just, uh, before I leave you, take a page out of Perry's book and leave you with one more uh, European language in the room today, uh, Gorev Malgat and Slangofoil. Thank you, <coughs> Kathy. Um, I'll be short uh, in the in the closing. Um, first, um, I, I think Ian, you summed it up uh, tremendously well. Uh, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and what I felt uh, from the opening uh, comments, from the two panels we heard, a lot of hope and intent, and a lot of violent agreement that we need to collaborate to achieve the goals we want. Um, we are addressing common solutions. I think venues like this, bringing business, bringing government, bringing different sectors together is what we will help solve. I, I have a new term, the, the supply net. So, so thank you uh, for that term. And I think that's the complexity of the world, uh, which means that solutions will not be linear. And, and so cooperation cannot be linear as well. We have very strong trust and common values with Europe. Uh, and Canada, and so we can be trustful of another to, to collaborate well. Um, I hope everyone uh, brought something out of today. And just uh, in final closing, I'd like to thank once again the ambassador from Ukraine for joining us, uh, the ambassador from the European Union, and again, uh, many thanks to Bennett Jones for hosting us here today. So I uh, wish you all well and uh, look forward to seeing you during lunch, and thanks again. <laughs>